does that temporary accommodation take into account of the fact that there's a young baby in there? And that's one of the questions that when we've looked at the data in this report, we've questioned actually, did, did somebody know there's a young baby? Was the, was the accommodation that provided suitable for them? Hi, I'm Laura Nielsen and welcome to Hope in the Deep End. We've put together this podcast to inspire us all to keep working in areas of deprivation and poverty. We're sharing best practice, stories, outcomes and some interesting thoughts and ideas. So whether you're working in primary care, secondary care, the charity sector or any of the other myriad of roles, please listen and help us to keep each other inspired. Welcome to Hope in the Deep End podcast and today we're talking about safer sleeping and trying to reduce the children who die suddenly and I'm here today with Jenny Ward from the Lullaby Trust. Hi Jenny. Hi, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. So um, it's really good to um, be chatting today because you've been working, your team's been working with Sam from the Shared Health team and looking at safer sleeping for um, children and babies particularly who are um, living in more deprived areas. So um, for those of us who are maybe not totally up to date. What is the evidence that we do have around safer sleeping um, in children? Okay, so what this really relates to and the things that most people will have heard of is sudden infant death syndrome. So those what used to be known as cop death. So they are essentially babies that are um, perfectly healthy who suddenly die and we don't find a cause for and there's still a, a fairly large now the rates have come down but we still have a big chunk of of babies who die in this country even in 2023 and we don't have a cause for them to die but safer sleep relates to that because what research has found is that certain um, practices that we do with um, with babies can reduce the chance of them dying of SIDS And that's a funny thing to say, because I've just said we don't know why they die. But we know that if you do some things, it it really does reduce it. So we've seen a reduction of of 80 percent in the number of babies that die since the early 1990s. Um, But what it does leave us with is is a really core group. And we know that um, the babies that die now are far more likely to come from certain kind of backgrounds and live in certain conditions. So, um, the message is the same for absolutely everybody, but it's about targeting and understanding who we need to reach. And so those those messages, those basic messages, I do remember when I had my first baby, um, who's now 18, you know, the midwife telling me about putting them on their back. And um, and I remember looking at this squirming, screaming thing, thinking, oh, no, because he just cries more on his back. Um, so what other messages? So we've got we've had back back to back back sleeping, haven't we, for a while? What other things are in the safer sleeping? We have, yeah. So um, that's that's the really big message. And as you say, it's not quite as simple as just saying do this and don't do this. We understand that now. Um, keeping the baby's sleeping place as clear as possible. And the safest thing is for them to have their own separate sleep space like a, that's designed for a baby to sleep in, like a cot or a Moses basket. Um, but we'll get on to why that, that's not actually um, a, a really easy place for some families to find. Um, keeping babies smoke free, so that's before they're born and after they're born. And of course, all, all throughout their childhood, lots of different really, really positive reasons to keep um, children away from smoke. And then there are other pieces of messaging as well, um, like trying not to overheat babies. So thinking about their bedding and that relates again to their to their sleeping space and not keeping it really flat so that things like pillows, so that sleeping places that aren't flat. Um, and, and then there's some really interesting discussions, of course, to have around um, things like buggies, car seats that aren't flat. Um, what do we do in those positions? What what do we know and how do we support families? So some really interesting messages in, in there and good discussions to have about um, how you look after your baby. Mm. And of course, like some mothers, don't they, are in a situation where they can go and design the nursery and um, there's a Netflix series at the moment about how to make your home more gorgeous, which which I just watch with envy, really, whilst surrounded by crisp packets and teenage children. Um, but, you know, they've designed these beautiful nurseries with bespoke furniture and it's all beautiful and wonderful. And, and also they seem to have these babies that like actually sleep. Um, but a lot of families aren't in that situation, are they? No, no, they're not. And actually, you could have a beautiful nursery, but... Your baby should really be in the same room as you for the first six months. So you've got at least six months of them really being in, in the same room as you. And, and part of the charity's development in becoming the Lullaby Trust, that, that was all about listening to people and listening to what kind of makes them um, 
listen to others, what, what draws them into advice. And part of that whole process has been us understanding the challenges that parents have and how our advice might be a block to real life, really. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, is it possible to have some of the images that we have traditionally had in some of our literature? And it probably isn't. So we've developed those and tried to make them a bit a bit more inclusive so they take they take that into account but also having messaging that's away from the ideal and i think that's where um if you're in a particular situation of any given night it doesn't that you don't need to be kind of um in a in really hard situation to actually face one night where you know you're absolutely shattered they're not very well um and, and things are just not working in the same way so you do something different so we're working through those trying to trying to understand and give give families really useful information so the co-sleeping thing is um we try and encourage mothers and fathers not to co-sleep don't we totally yeah. um i think it's really interesting in reality <laughs> um, yes, because is. i think when you've got this baby that's snotty and snuffly and crying all night then it, it's quite um it's quite interesting isn't it so i think i think that kind of development of the guidelines that fit real life is really helpful isn't it um and and we've we've been playing through scenarios haven't we so what do you do if you're staying somewhere different for a night and you can't take all the paraphernalia on a bus um you know you you can't take a buggy a travel cot uh you know everything that babies kind of have to have now um, on the bus so what do you do and I think that that thinking has been really helpful um working through with a lullaby trust what we actually going to be able to say to to families exactly. in and I think situations what, what we've done in recent years is to I suppose listen and look at all the the information that's there and think well our ideal is that a baby sleeps in their own cot and it's um you know totally flat surface and it's in the same room as their parents or carers but that's not really what happens every single night and we know that the basically the vast majority of families do co-sleep with their baby at some point. So at, um, what do we, how do we challenge that? Um, because I think that saying to people never co-sleep is actually for some families, something that just turns them off from our messaging at, at mm-hmm. completely. But data that's come out from certainly from England in the last few months shows that over half of the babies that die without a cause die in an adult bed. Um, and of those, just about all of them are in high risk situations. So we're trying to break down those two things. There's the co-sleeping part and then there's the high risk part. Um, and which bit can we change most? Which bit can we kind of get people, I, I suppose, attuned to? And I think it's those high risk elements. It's really, really drumming in that if you have drunk any alcohol, your baby needs to be in a separate sleep space. Mm. Full stop. End of um and if if you or your partner smoke same thing in in their separate sleep space but i think then it's about how we target other pieces of advice so really i think it's about targeting and understanding um the difference that we can make um and you know hope part of this and part of the work that we've done with you is to consider are families able to follow our ideal advice and if they're not why and how what's the next best that we can offer them Mm. And I think we'd we'd all agree, wouldn't we? The same as that if you've taken any other substances, if you've taken drugs or anything else, then your baby needs to be in a separate place. Mm-hmm. Um, so the kind of cot thing, it can be Moses basket, kind of. It can be a cot, and um, it can be a baby box when they're very very small. Yeah. Um, so my dad tells this story that he was born in the war. So he was born in forty four. I think it's his claim to fame that he was, you know, born in the war. Um, and he was um, put in a drawer, which I think was quite common at that point. So the drawer yeah. was taken out the bottom of the chest of drawers and he was placed in the drawer. And um, actually, think about it, it's quite sensible, isn't it? Because It's, it's flat, not a bad so... place for a baby no. to sleep. And actually, no. even with cardboard boxes, I'm sure it's the Cameron's baby that's born and surprised on holiday, wasn't they, in Cornwall. Yeah. <laughs> they set the baby in a cardboard box on day, on day one because they, they didn't have anything else. So, yeah, I think it's... Um, and we're quite lucky because there are now some regulations around a large number of products. So even if you don't have a cot, there are things like travel cots, there are Moses baskets, 
And there are baby boxes that can be a really affordable place for your baby to sleep that has been designed to have a baby in it. Mm -hmm. So the, the baby boxes that you have would have far more regulations on them now than the one that the Cameron's baby slept in in day one. And it has a mattress that fits fits that perfectly. So there wouldn't be a kind of putting a cushion in there or anything mm -hmm. like that. It is actually you know a place that's designed for a baby to sleep. And it's thinking about where what all those different options are and how we can make sure that families have access to one of those. So, for example, a, um, a travel cot is, is pretty small. So I think most hotels, if they don't have room for a cot or they don't have that kind of supply, they have got a travel cot. And that's OK. That's not a bad solution. Um, and if you're living in a really small space, that's actually not a really handy thing to have because the baby gets older, you can kind of plonk them in it and go to the toilet, have a shower, whatever, and they're, they're in a they're in a, a safe safe space that's there. So it's those multiple uses and making sure people are aware of the different things that they can do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like you said, a drawer is not a bad option. Um, a lot of people have a pram, so if that lies flat, that's actually you know, that can be a good place to put your baby if, as you're moving around as well. So yeah, there are some good options out there. Yeah. And I think it's about thinking, isn't it? What's, what is realistic and practical um, in the circumstances you are. So I know that quite a lot of our team go out and see um, families and, you know, and the circumstances aren't ideal. So it's what's the steps we can make to make it, as you say, safer, yeah. reduce the risk. Um, and, and there are, you know, lots of, there are good options out there, which is, yeah. which is good. There are. And, and what we know also is in some of those circumstances, if, if your ideal involves, I don't know, six things in, in that family's life changing, we're probably not going to be able to get all six to change. So what's the one that we can make today and we can really drum in and that's actually going to reduce things, you know, a, a decent amount. And that that hopefully is going to make a difference. And we talk about blankets. Is that all right? Yes, of course. Um, so we're just going to do some really practical stuff. So um, there's a variety of things you can put your baby to sleep in, isn't there? Are there some big no's and are there some big yeses from a safer sleep perspective? Yeah, definitely no duvets and pillows. They shouldn't be used for babies under the age of one. And that doesn't mean to say that on their first birthday, you can give them a big <laughs> feather duvet and a pillow. Actually, they're fine with very, very minimal things. Um, one of the key risk factors that comes out of SIDS is overheating and I suspect that like adults, babies are very different in terms of what they cope with and, and what they don't. I've, I've got two children and one of them had, um, you know, would always, even now as they're teenagers, will have a really thick duvet and the other one has a summer one throughout the year. Babies are exactly the same. So you have to get to know them and get to know what, what is right for them. So really start with the lightest that you can. Um, so the other thing that we know is a risk is anything covering a baby's face. So loose blankets um, are a definite no. Um, a solution could be to use something like a sleeping bag, but you have to make sure that fits. And again, start with the lower, lower, you know, talk rating that you can. Even if you feel cold, um, just make sure you check your baby. And that's their chest and their back. So if they're feeling a bit clammy, they're a bit sweaty. But otherwise, just use layers, make sure they're thin, um, no thick blankets, things like that. Keep it, keep it really, really um, minimal. So you're going to have your baby in its like little baby grow vest and then maybe like um, a baby growing legs and arms are on top. And then you're going to put, you know, maybe a sleeping suit or some thin blankets, but they, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be able to wriggle and pull them over their faces, should they? Because no. they're quite, that is a, that is a big risk factor. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and they can move around. You can put them in a place and feel like they really can't move. And we often get calls from families saying, you know, I woke up and my baby was, you know, upside down in the cotton effect, you know, if they've managed to do 180 degrees and they're just a few weeks old, because they can do things randomly. Um, and we don't know the first night that they're going to be able to roll over or, or grab their blanket and pull it off. So it's always making sure that you're the one taking, making that sleep, sleep space as safe as possible. And so no toys, teddies, you know, uh, bumper bar things that's really whatever. mean doesn't it i'm the mean yeah. takeaway they just don't need those things um young babies don't need it. it's for us we know that it looks really nice and a little baby in a cot looks really kind of lonely and small but they're absolutely fine and and a baby's mattress that you buy and like a travel cot like a pram they're quite hard you know they're not really really soft 
Um, and that's deliberate. That's because we know that having a firm sleep space is safer. Their heads can sink into something that's softer and they can't kind of cool themselves down in the same way that we can. So don't worry. Don't try and make it more comfortable. They're absolutely fine. That's great. And then the temperature of the room Um this is a difficult one, isn't it? So there is a there's a recommended range of temperatures um, of the bedrooms. And obviously, we've just had this very, very cold snap. And today feels freezing again. I don't actually know what the temperature is. But, um, you know, just before Christmas, we had that very, very cold snap, didn't we? So what what do we recommend about babies' room temperatures? So the ideal is between 16 and 20 degrees. So I, um, well, I mean, before we hit this kind of cost of living crisis, I think most people had their, if they had central heating, it was set on, um, you know, somewhere between 20 and 25. So it's a bit cooler. You don't need to keep your heating on all night. But equally, whether we're in a cold spell or a hot spell, it's not, you can't necessarily get the room to the ideal temperature. But what you can do is to control what your baby is covered with. And you can add a few more layers or take some away. Um, So yeah, 16 to 20 degrees. It's a bit cooler than you might expect. Yeah, that is a bit cooler, isn't it? Um, so okay. So we've got we've got the temperature, we've got smoke free, we've got the cot or the sleeping place, we've got a firm mattress, we've got no other shenanigans in the cot, and we've got them in a kind of sleeping bag or a or blankets that are kind of well fitting. So and that that is and then we've got them on the back. Yes. So a lot of mums say to me, it's really fine, but they just don't sleep on their back. They like they like snuggling into the bed and they sleep with the bottoms in the air and um what it's hard isn't it like I think we just need to talk about the reality of this as for mums it is it is hard yeah it is hard and one of the things that we're doing at the moment is to really focus those messages in the antenatal period and part of that is because if your baby has never slept on their front then they don't know that's a nicer position that they like so actually from day one being really kind of strict about you're safer on your back um it is really important and perseverance uh i mean yeah that one thing might work on one night for a baby but it might not on the next so um it's understanding that you know you're not just gonna it's not gonna have a settled baby within a few days this is not this is not how they work um those are really important messages to to get across to people mm. And I think the wider family is really important as well, like grandmas, aunties, cousins, friends who are kind of aunties, you know, that whole kind of um that kind of paraphernalia that happens with other people when you have a baby. So we Absolutely. need the we need the community to be having the messages, don't we? Because Yeah, yeah. It's and hard. challenging that. Yeah, challenging. It's hard, isn't it? I mean, I we might work in this area, but you could easily see on social media a friend or family member who posts what looks like a beautiful photo of their of their baby that you know is in uh, an unsafe sleeping position and how do you kind of gently challenge that um, but also as I said these these messages have really made a difference since the early 1990s so before that most babies were slept on their front and because we thought that was the safest thing for them we thought that if they were going to be sick then that um, meant that they didn't have a risk of kind of choking which we now know is not the case that they do turn their heads so anybody born kind of Pre the 1990s probably was slept on their front and you know if they're here now then they um, thankfully that that didn't have an impact on them in, in SIDS but unfortunately the rates before that were really really high so we've managed to get them down and we need to learn from that and so yeah that takes the village as you say. I mean 80% is an amazing reduction isn't it that is staggering Yeah, um, but good. it is also another thing I can like put on my mum's list of things she did wrong. Um <laughs> <laughs> Um, just talking about that is I'm a twin. Um, so, uh, and actually my, my mom had two sets of twins, which, um, was interesting. So I definitely shared a cot and a pram and an everything with my twin for quite a long time. Now that was the eighties. Yeah. Are we still in that vein? Or if you have lots of chill, lots of babies, if you have twins or babies close together, what do we say about that now? Well, that's a really interesting one, actually. We, we've got a joint leaflet with Bliss and with the Twins Trust, which talks about um, there is an increased risk to prem and low birth weight babies, which, of course, multiples quite often are. Uh, but one of the things is that we really have to weigh up what, what is right for you and your family, because we want the babies to stay in the same room as you. 
And ideally, if, if you are born premolar low birth weight, if you were multiple, you're more likely to have been one of those, then it's really, really important for you to be in the same room. And it's really important that you're not sharing a bed with an adult. So how do you easily meet that? And when babies are really young, having if you can fit one cot in your room, then that might be a good solution. And quite often they sleep kind of say their heads um, so the feet are opposite ends of the cot, but that doesn't last forever. When they start, when babies start to move around, then actually they need to have their own sleep space. So what works, and how can you keep them in in the adult room for as long as possible? So interesting discussions to have there. But as babies start to move, basically they need their own sleep space. And those whole issues of blankets going overhead. So if you've got two babies wriggling in in a cot, you can kind of see there's a point at which that's going to become a bit of a risk. So um, yeah, it's about discussing that and how you kind of keep them um with you but as safe as possible yeah i'm just gonna ask the really like you might think it's a really silly question but um obviously your baby shouldn't really have your pet sleeping with them at the same time we'll just put that out there but like i know a lot of people go the dog really loves the baby and the baby really loves the cat and we're all one happy family and that is brilliant isn't it your babies and your pets and your toddlers can definitely interact it's definitely good for child development and stuff but but not at bedtime and not sleeping no definitely not keep them well away I mean uh, aside from the safety aspect because with any pet you cannot 100% guarantee their own behavior mm-hmm. and you can't with babies either so they do suddenly grab things and that's a risk if you leave them alone um, but equally it's again keeping that baby's airway as clear as possible mm-hmm. And actually, a real cat compared to a cuddly toy cat, they're both going to be at risk. We know that when you're co-sleeping, the baby, if if you are bringing your baby into bed with you, if there are other children in there and there are pets on there, that's an increased risk. So we know that. So that's a definite no. So, yeah, keep keep them apart, but supervise if if you want to kind of integrate them in some way. <laughs> So it's always so it's about thinking of risk, isn't it? And I think what what you've started to do is pick out the risks that when they add together become multiples, really. Yeah, so, um, and it's about trying to reduce those risks down. So, um, the um National Child Mortality Data base is really interesting. So it was the first time that we'd asked collectively for that brilliant team with Professor Fleming to look at temporary accommodation and um children who died unexpectedly, yes. and. We found that 34 children had died over a three-year period. We are going to rerun that research, or Professor Fleming's team's rerunning it, because the methodology involved looking for free text. So now they're capturing that data much more methodically, so it might increase again when it's rerun in a year's time. Temporary accommodation, and when you think about the risks that you've just taken us through, having, having very small babies living in temporary accommodation you start to understand how that how we get to 34 absolutely. don't you you do absolutely and it's we also know there's something something that happened different on that particular day when a baby dies seems to be something out of routine is is a really key message and if you're in temporary accommodation that's that's pretty much you know something that's really key to you um and it's has that temporary accommodation taken account of the fact that there's a young baby in there and that's one of the questions that when we've looked at the data in this report we've questioned actually did, did somebody know there's a young baby was the was the accommodation that provided suitable for them we know they need their own sleeping space we know that they need to be in the same room as the parents those are really key things was that able to happen and the overheating as well one thing that we we touched about you know the average the room temperature but if you think about the position of a cot so obviously ideally you have the ability to to move your cot to the ideal position so it's not next to a radiator in the winter and so that it's not in a direct sunlight in the summer Um, and often you don't have that ability if you're in um, accommodation that you haven't chosen yourself or that is very small. So, yeah, there are key key questions to be asked there, which I think is really important for those families. And we're obviously continuing jointly to campaign about um, that cot save lives, and it's it just shouldn't be even a question in this in this in this country and in this time really. So that every baby in every situation, whatever their housing situation, has an access to a safe safer sleeping place or cot Moses basket yeah. something that's been designed for them and has gone through the testing yeah so absolutely it's a key thing that. isn't it when I when yeah. I raise that with people people seem really shocked like really babies are 
don't necessarily get a car well they where they should and it should be something that's on everybody's mind we've got a baby here where are you, where is that baby going to sleep and it's not it doesn't have to, we've discussed all the different alternatives there are but actually that key question can change somebody's mindset where where is your baby going to sleep tonight or where did your baby sleep last night they're really key questions we need to be prepared for the the different answers and be prepared to um do something if that answer isn't right that's that's really helpful. Um, as a lullaby trust, you do a whole load of amazing activities that we just thought it would be good for our um, wonderful community that we're building um, to know about. So first of all, you do offer quite a lot of training, don't you? We do. Want do. To tell us we a do. bit about that. Yeah, that's all online now since COVID. So um, the team that we used to have that went out and about now do that online. And it's a brilliant there's lots of different levels that you can access it will test you you're not you don't just have to sit there and listen to somebody for three hours there are lots of different elements to it so do go on and have a look have a look at the free options have a look at the ones that are directed to specific um, groups of professionals so yeah please do access that that's cool and then um you touched very very um quickly at the beginning um about your support um after a child dies and i have to say i haven't I haven't seen it very often in my career, thankfully, but when I have seen it, it's it's just horrific, isn't it? It's it's horrific for everybody involved, but um particularly the parents. And I think that grief is quite a complicated grief. It's it is, yeah. It's we, not so do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, we we now very much kind of focus on that as being um a trauma as well. That this is a sudden death, and if anybody has been involved whether it's a baby or not and any any sudden death is traumatic and involves lots of different professional formalities and and things that families don't realize and when it's your baby when it's the thing that you are meant to um many families say you know I was meant to look after this baby and, and it died and we don't know why um that's a huge amount of um guilt that many families feel and so it's really useful for them to link up with us and we have a team of befrienders and they're all bereaved um parents as well as grandparents aunts and uncles and siblings uh that we pair them we pair families up with and that's a really key service to understand that there are people who have been through this they will never have been through exactly the same but they will have been through something that's vaguely similar um and they can talk to you about um you know the fact that they're they are getting on with life and how they've managed to do that and how that baby is they're never forgotten but how they kind of fit into their life moving forward I think that's hugely powerful. I think, you know, one of the things of any big experiences, don't you? It's amazingly comforting to know you're not the only one. And then all those huge range of emotions you go through and the toll it takes on your relationships and your mental health and and everything, your understanding of life. And um, to be able to walk that journey with another family that's been through that, I think that is such a gift. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. and they're, they're amazing people themselves because they have been through um, something incredibly traumatic and then they come back and get trained and pick up the phone again and again to others going through that. Um, and they're really quite inspirational to listen to about what, what it is that motivates them to do that. And it's knowing where they were at the point at which their baby died and, and wanting some to help somebody else through that, sometimes because the, the befriender that they had years ago was was helpful to them. So, yeah, it's a re- really key service that we've got. And the other thing is that, um, you know, we know it's difficult to access any kind of medical support or access something formally if you want needed to, like bereavement counselling at some point. But charities like the Lullaby Trust and others are open every single day of the year. Like we, our bereavement support line is open 365 days a year. We've, we haven't had a day off throughout COVID or anything else. There is always a time when it's open and you don't have to pay for that and there's no waiting list. So that's something to always, we kind of, Try to drum into people. There is support there. Go out and you, you can find it. You're not alone. And I think that's really helpful. So um, we know that other our community of uh, people who join us in listening and think about these issues is quite a mixed bag, actually, of healthcare professionals and social care professionals and people interested and people who do lots of charity work. And actually, if you're in a role, knowing that the Lullaby Trust is there at the back of your brain so that if you ever hit the situation, you can direct people in the right place. So, you know, if you're a GP or a midwife or health visitor or, you know, all those touch points that we have with families, um, 
you know, knowing that there's a, I mean, how brilliant is that as a consultation to be able to say, here's a phone number, you can ring them any any day, 365 yeah. days a year, you can ring them on Christmas, you yeah. can ring them on, on the anniversary, you can ring them just because you can't get out of bed, yeah, you can exactly. ring them. That is that is such an amazing thing to be offering. So um, yeah. thank you. No, no, absolutely. And the other thing to just, I mean, one of the key questions that people ask us, they might say, if I had done X, would my baby still be alive? And those are questions. Yes, we know the statistics. We've been talking about all these, but to be honest, we don't know that. We just don't know. These are high risk situations. This is about making things as safe as possible, but um, we still don't. There are still babies that die in, in, you know, that are lying on their backs in cots and they aren't overheated. They're a minority, but they are there. Um, so we need to kind of just explain that to families. But the other question they often ask is, uh, that even at an early stage, it can be a case of if I had another baby, would this happen again? Yeah. And yeah. Again, we we wouldn't give kind of reassurance of, of course not, you know, it doesn't <laughs> happen like that. It's actually, um, well, you know, we'd hope not, but we do have a programme called the Care of Next Infant programme that will support support you if um, if you do decide to have another, have another baby. And I think that's really key, isn't it? Like, I think that is one of the most difficult journeys to walk alongside parents with actually is that kind of the yearning to have another baby so strong but the the mixed emotions in the pregnancy and the mixed emotions afterwards and the kind of grief with joy is is quite potent isn't it and it's a and there aren't any guarantees and it's yeah it's it's a it's an interesting uh, journey to walk through with a family like that actually yeah, and and I think as healthcare professionals and others who are supporting families it's a it's a fine line as well about offering lots and lots of reassurance and advice and access and then not actually it becoming unhealthy, you know, concern yeah. about this baby. Yeah. Um, and that is an interesting, you know, thing to, for us to all think about and walk together and talk about together. I think one of the things yeah, about absolutely. these situations is that if we talk to each other and look after, um, when we're looking after patients, look, look after them as a team, it, it helps because your emotions go a bit funny as well so <laughs> yeah yeah and, and there is I mean what I would say to professionals as well is there is there is support on our website for professionals as well and our care of next infant program anyone can access some basic level training and think about that so it and the resources that we have many of which are now available online so even if you don't have the care of next infant program available where you are there are things that you can access and it's really about supporting and listening to families. So knowing that they are in, in the majority, not all, but in the majority of cases, they're going to be very anxious with future babies. So how do we keep an eye on that? How do we give them access to um, a health professional if they need it? And really what we want is for them to enjoy being a parent to the next baby, to have some kind of relaxation. So how can we all work together, um, understanding that it's not going to be um, very easy for them, but how can we kind of make it better? That's brilliant. That's amazing. So we're going to put loads of links um, to this podcast, to your website and your training. And um, so we really encourage people to go and have a look at that um, and just do some of those taster training sessions. Just read, um, even if you haven't got the time or the ability to go on the kind of full in-depth training, then get yourself a bit more knowledgeable. It's a, it's a good thing to do. Was there anything else you wanted to say, Jenny, before we finish? No, the only other thing that we've been working on that we're starting to think about, firstly, I spoke about getting that advice out in the antenatal period, so everybody knows that. But one of the key risk groups that we've touched upon are prem and low birth weight babies. Yeah. And actually, we think that the majority of those can be identified antenatally. Um, and so really thinking about those high risk families that we know about. So um, young families, families where a parent smokes with a baby's born prem, or low birth weight, or they are in um, living in deprived conditions, they're in temporary housing. Those are the ones that we want you to kind of tie, you know, have an alarm bell ringing somewhere. How can I support them? Have I spoken to them about safer sleep? Because you can't say it enough. It's all of us mm -hmm. together can make a difference. And I think that period when when low birth weight babies and prone babies come out of hospital is such a joy, isn't it? And everyone kind of almost like breathe a sigh of relief you get the discharge letter the baby's been in like four or five months and they're feeding and they're they're in a tiny smidge of oxygen but not very much and you know it's all kind of looking really good and I think at that point we can all kind of think oh brilliant 
the path is straight now, but actually that's the other group of babies, isn't it, who unfortunately do suffer from unexpected death. And and as a group of professionals, not just saying, oh, fantastic, they've got to five months and they're, you know, actually keeping an eye on them for longer is probably important Yeah, absolutely. Well. And it's a difficult conversation, isn't it, to have with the family to say your baby is at high risk. Um, but, you know, you're all professionals who have experience of working with families. So it's using the skills you've already got in communication to kind of sit there and say, for you, this advice is really, really important. So let's talk about, you know, where's your baby going to sleep? What are you going to do on a night where you've gone out and had a few drinks? It's it's having those conversations and families want them. They want to have that. They want to know. Yeah, that's really good. Well, it's been absolutely brilliant chatting to you. And um, thank you so much for uh, the joint work we've done together. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting year ahead. Um, yes, yeah. There's lots more to come, I think. Um, but yeah, lots of lots of really great resources. I think we've touched on kind of a few of them, but I know you're going to post links. There's loads of stuff on our website. Have a search through, find the thing that will help you and the families you work with. Yeah. And and things like we've designed a leaflet with you guys. It's like um, how to do safer sleeping um, when you're, you know, got an unusual night ahead of you and it's in simple English and it looks really beautiful and it's not it's not preachy and it's not kind of patronising. So, um, you know, the, all those resources are there for you to have in your clinic bag, to take out on your visits, to to gently um, talk to parents um, and grandparents and carers. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to Thank chat you. to you. Thank you. Great to Thank work you. with you. Lovely to chat to you.